So let's go ahead and start. We have some compulsive rule followers who are carefully drinking their coffee outside. But, uh, for the rest of us, let's go ahead and uh, have Arup talk to us about communication complexity. Uh, thank you. Um, so uh, I'm going to give it a, a two-hour talk on communication complexity. It's kind of hard to figure out what to talk about because it's a, it's a huge area and uh, could teach two semesters on it. Um, so what I try to do is uh, maybe a little bit unusual. So uh, uh, f first, I'm going to sort of give you, tell you a little bit about why I'm, I, I like, really like communication complexity. Um, and then I'm going to discuss some very basic results, but I hope that uh, uh, some of you will still see something uh, really new and want to discuss. So l maybe, maybe let me first start with just the big picture of why I'm drawn to communication complexity. So this is a picture that uh, uh, it took me some time being in theoretical computer science to realize that this is what the picture was. And one, once I realized that this is what the picture is, I, I was really drawn to communication complexity. Communication complexity is this really simple model um, computational model, but it has this outsized role in how it connects uh, different ideas uh, in theory and, out and outside theory. So on the one hand, um, it's a really natural and, and, and beautiful model, and that means that a lot of diverse ideas from mathematics say something about it. So, you know, old uh, results in mathematics from uh, areas like geometry, information theory, and combinatorics, they all seem to say something about the same model, the model of communication complexity. So that's one aspect that it has. And that means that if you, if you work in communication complexity, you get to uh, interact with these very beautiful concepts and areas. It's the one thing I really like about it. And on the other hand, um, the results that are proved in communication complexity then get used by a really large uh, family of different areas. So lower bounds proved in communication complexity have been used to uh, prove lower bounds on circuits and proof complexity. We already saw Pavel mention some of these applications uh, in, on streaming algorithms and branching programs, data structures, um, and understanding the extension complexity of polytopes, and in distributed computing. And this list is just, it keeps growing. So, you know, this thing just keeps growing. And, uh, this, I hope, also will keep growing. It's growing at a slower pace. Um, <clears throat> but so the, the upshot is, you know, I don't think there is any danger that uh, communication complexity is a, is a fad uh, because of this, this picture, you know. Uh, <clears throat> all of these different models really care about communication one way or another. So uh, you're, you're guaranteed that if you, if, you, if you work on this, then you will uh, if you solve at least important questions here, you will uh, have an impact. <clears throat> so that's why I like thinking about communication complexity. I think it's really important and beautiful. Um, <clears throat> now, as for what I'm going to do today, um, I realized that I couldn't really do justice to this side of the picture. They take a long time to explain. So what I'm going to try and do is mostly focus my time on this side of the picture. And, and that's also, it's, it's both very interesting, and I think a lot of people don't, uh, know about that side of the picture as well as they know about this side in, in complexity. So I, I think in, in, in this audience, maybe you'll learn more from me talking about this side of the picture. <coughs> um, <clears throat> so that's what I'll do. Um, but first, uh, so, so let me mention that, uh, let me plug my book. So Amir and I have been writing, working on a textbook to capture all of this. Uh, and uh, it should be ready sometime early next year, but there's a, there's a draft that's available on my website. So if you're curious, go take a look, and we welcome your comments. OK, so what I'm going to do for the, for the rest of the talk is uh, I, I want to quickly sort of uh, uh, tell you about three directions that, are, that have very interesting open questions. Uh, they're, all three are, um, have, are pretty fundamental. Um, and, but, but also, there's been relatively recent uh, progress on all three questions. So I think they're good questions to think about. Uh, so I, I'll qu qu quickly do that, and then I'll start uh, telling you a little bit about communication protocols and some of these applications. <coughs> okay, 
so the, the first direction I want to talk about is uh, the famous log rank conjecture. <clears throat> so what is the conjecture? So suppose you have uh, uh, two players who are trying to compute a function. You know, so suppose you have uh, uh, the setup where, where you have two-party communication complexity. So there are two parties, Alice and Bob. Each has an input, and they want to compute some function f of x, y. Then a natural way to think of what they're doing is to think of them as trying to find an, find an entry of a matrix. Okay, so you can, you can encode the function f so that uh, really you can think of their inputs as i, j, and they're trying to compute the m, i, you know, the i, j, the entry of the matrix m. So they're trying to compute an entry in a Boolean matrix. And once you encode the function in this way, then it's natural to talk about the rank of this matrix. Uh, <coughs> Um, <clears throat> and the, the log rank conjecture uh, says, uh, made by Loas and Sachs, says that uh, says that the communication complexity of this problem is closely related to the log of the rank. It's up to polynomial. Uh, it's polynomially related to the log of the rank of this matrix. That's that's the conjecture. So it's a really simple conjecture. It's really beautiful, and. Um, <clears throat> uh, there's been recent progress on it. So uh, uh, Lovas and Sachs made this conjecture sometime in the maybe early 90s or late 80s. I wasn't around. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, only a few years ago, uh, uh, Lovet, building on work with uh, Gavinsky and others, proved that. Uh, so so it's, it's easy to see that the communication complexity of, of such a problem is always at least the log of the rank. Um, and in terms of upper bounds, the conjecture is that it's bounded by polylog of the, <coughs> the rank. And what uh, Lovett showed is that it, it can be bounded by uh, square root of the rank times the log factor. It's also easy to show that it can be bounded by just the rank. So he, he improved the bound from rank, the sort of easy upper bound of rank to square root of rank. And it's a really beautiful proof. Uh, it involves uh, a very nice result from convex geometry called John's theorem that I really like. Um, so, so, so that's what he proved. And the conjecture is that it can be brought all the way down to polylog of rank. Now, I just want to mention, because it, the, this concept might show up later uh, today, there's another way to look at the rank of a matrix, which is you can define the non-negative rank of a matrix. And uh, the non-negative rank is uh, <clears throat> just the minimum R such that the matrix M can be expressed as a sum of R rank one non-negative matrices. If you remove the non-negative condition here, you exactly get back the definition of rank. So it's just insisting that your breakdown into rank one matrices is non-negative. Um, and for, for non-negative rank, we do know that the communication is sort of polynomially related to the, the rank. So this is a result of uh, Lovas. Uh, so the conjecture is equivalent to saying <coughs> rank plus and rank are sort of quasi polynomially related? Uh, almost. I think it's equivalent to saying that they're related for Boolean matrices. Okay. So, uh, yeah, so it's kind of interesting. So uh, when a matrix is not Boolean, the non-negative rank can be arbitrarily far from the rank. Uh -huh. We have exa simple examples that show this. Um, but uh, I think when the matrix is Boolean, then it's really equivalent to saying that the non-negative rank is close to the, the rank. Actually, now that you mentioned this, there was there a, uh, uh, is there a notion like this for partial functions, and is that known to be false? Mm -hmm. Partial functions? I don't know. Does anyone have, do you know? No, I don't know. What's the rank of a partially defined matrix? Mm -hmm. You can minimize over all matrices, uh, but then the question is whether you're minimizing over Boolean matrices or <coughs> arbitrary matrices, I guess. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
proof, actually, if you don't like thinking about communication, it's nothing to do with communication almost. What, what, what Lovett actually proved is that if you have a Boolean matrix of rank R, then there's a monochromatic submatrix of density 2 to the minus square root R. This is the key step that he proved. If there's a Boolean matrix of rank R, then it has a monochromatic submatrix of density 2 to the minus square root R. And that square root R is this square root R. So just improve that square root R to uh, 2 to the minus polylog R, and that's really what this is about. Show that low rank matrices have large monochromatic submatrices. This is almost necessary to prove. And yeah, it's uh, more or less equivalent. So it's just a statement about the combinatorial properties of low rank Boolean matrices. Um, so, so could you repeat what, what is the density? Uh, it's this number. So whatever you get here, so I'll write. What is the definition of density? Oh, what is the dense definition? Yeah, what is the definition and ah. what is the value? <laughs> so uh, the, the, def the definition means that the size of the submatrix, the submatrix covers a 2 to the minus square root r fraction of all the entries in the matrix. So maybe I'll write it here. So what, what I thought I showed is that uh, if uh, m has a rank uh, r, then <coughs> this means that m has a uh, Submatrix uh, L and L has uh, uh, covers two to the minus uh, square root R fraction of the entries in F. And L is constant because the value on L is constant. Uh, it's uh, yeah monochromatic submatrix. It's constant. Square matrix? Square matrix. Uh, it doesn't need to be square. That's not important. Um, okay. <clears throat> okay, so, and, and uh, as Madhu was pointing out, that, that's essentially equivalent to the, the log rank conjecture. Okay, so, uh, whatever parameter you find here, that parameter is the same as the parameter here. Okay, so that's one direction. Uh, another direction that I really like, um, that I worked on, uh, is uh, uh, understanding the, the relationship between information uh, of messages in protocols and the communication required to transmit them. So <clears throat> I don't want to spend too much time getting into it, but uh, I'll just say, so given a communication protocol that's randomized, so there's some, imagine that there's a distribution on inputs x and y, and the parties themselves can use randomness to communicate uh, messages about these, inf uh, these inputs. There's a natural way to define the information that the parties learn from these messages. So not all messages communicate information. You know, if I send Alice completely random string, this is, complete, this is useless in terms of the amount of information it communicates about my input. So you can, you can use uh, Shans, Shannon's notions of information to measure, to quantify exactly how much information is contained in the messages. And uh, uh, very nice uh, questions. Uh, you can ask nice questions about, you know, how is the information related to the communication? So can you simulate any C-bit protocol, any protocol that communicates C-bits that has information I with a small amount of communication? So the best result we, we have in this direction uh, is uh, that you can simulate such a protocol with communication that's proportional to square root, the geometric, basically the geometric mean of the information the, and the original communication, okay, times some log factors. <coughs> um, and this was proved uh, by uh, Behrman, Barak, uh, Chen, and myself. Uh, Barak, Behrman, Chen, and myself. And, uh, very recently, Shurstov uh, showed that in, in, the, in, the case that uh, in the case that the inputs x and y are independent, you can simulate this with communication that looks like i polylog i. So it's still open to improve these kinds of bounds in general. So, so maybe here, what you could hope to do is prove that such a protocol can be simulated with communication uh, i times polylog c. It's important that i is always a lower bound on c. 
I is always uh, at, uh, at most C. Yeah. <coughs> okay, so it's another direction. It's a, it's a whole world. So I, I, if, if you didn't follow it, uh, it's okay. Um, but there are very nice questions of this type. So, I know. Yeah. So, the previous vote was about the deterministic protocols, right? Yes. And this one is about the uh, public or shared values. Yes. That's true. Yeah. Yeah, so this, this is about. Here I was talking about deterministic protocols, and uh, here it's about randomized protocols. Uh, and uh, now I'm going to talk about uh, a third kind of model, uh, <coughs> and that's the so this is the last another direction where I think there's tons of open questions, and uh, also relatively recent progress, uh, which maybe not everyone is aware. Of. Um, <coughs> so this is the number on forehead model of uh, communication. So <coughs> in this model of communication. Uh, you have k parties, and each of them has an input that's on their forehead. So each of them can see everyone else's input, but not their own, not the input that's on their forehead. Okay. And they're trying to compute some function that depends on all of their inputs. <coughs> um, so <coughs> this model has uh, a ton of applications. Lower bounds on this model will have a ton of applications to things like circuits and proofs. So it's uh, um, very important in that sense. Um, and we've known for a while, uh, since I guess the early 90s or late 80s, uh, you know, Baba and Nissan and Segeri showed uh, uh, lower bounds of the type uh, n over 4 to the k in this model. So they show that there are uh, functions, very natural functions, that require n over the 4 to the k uh, bits to, to, to communicate in this model. <coughs> And one really interesting example is the disjointness function, which uh, it turns out for applications is particularly uh, important. It keeps show showing up over and over when you talk about this side of the picture as well. And, and there, uh, the best lower bound for randomized protocols was proved uh, maybe four years ago by Shurstov. He showed, and this is uh, after a long sequence of works with many ideas, eventually uh, reached the bound of uh, square root n over 2 to the k. So, so here the inputs to the parties are sets, and they want to know if uh, sets on the universe 1 through n, and they want to know if the intersection of all these sets is empty or not. And uh, <coughs> this remains the best bound we have for randomized protocols. We can prove that you need square root n over 2 to the k bits of communication. Uh, and uh, following this work, uh, Amir and and myself improved this bound to n over 4 to the k for deterministic protocols. Okay, but there's still an open question of how can you, you know, get rid of the square root n for randomized protocols. So that's one open question which I think might be in reach. <coughs> and, uh, but maybe the, the most important question in this, in this domain is just finding any function for which you can prove a lower bound of the type n over poly, uh, polynomial in k instead of n over exponential in k. For disjointness, is exponential not necessary? Or yes. So for, for both the generalized inner product and disjointness, and actually a wide class of functions, uh, you can show that uh, there are protocols that can get uh, upper bounds that, that, that look like n over 4 to the k. So in, in, in all of these, actually, the, the, the known upper bounds look like n over 2 to the k. So actually, another interesting question that would be very interesting to me is to change the 4 to 2 in the lower bounds, because upper bounds have 2 to the k. Is this related to uh, like, uh, lower bounds on like, polynomial subtotal between log n? Because that's, yeah. that will also have like a Yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah, so this, this model, and, and uh, uh, I think Pavel discussed this in his talk. So the, the reason that it's uh, very nice is that in this model, if you have k players, you can compute every polynomial of degree k minus 1 very cheaply. Uh, that's because every monomial can be seen by one of the players. Uh, so this, this, this model is able to compute polynomials very efficiently, low degree polynomials. And, and that's kind of, I think, how a lot of the connection from here to lower bounds on circuits goes and, and proofs also. Okay. Uh, so that, that was just a, a brief tour of uh, some open questions. Um, <coughs> what I want to do now 
there no more. Question about those is to uh, actually what I will do is I, I want to start by uh, just giving two. I don't I don't want to spend a lot of time defining exactly what I mean by a communication protocol uh, because I think it's, it takes too much time and maybe it's not worth it. But uh, I, w I do want to give you. Uh, maybe one or maybe two examples of uh, really interesting <coughs> communication protocols. So that's another thing that I think maybe people don't talk about so much. So there, there are very nice non-trivial protocols that are very clever. And uh, maybe I'll show you two of them. Uh, so the first protocol I want to talk about is uh, due to uh, Hassad and Wigderson. And it's a protocol for disjointness. Okay, so we just talked about the disjointness function. So let me uh, uh, write down exactly what, it, what the setup is. So here, uh, Alice and uh, Bob have sets. Okay, so Alice has a set x that comes from uh, the universe 1 through n, and Bob has a set y that comes from 1 through n. Uh, in addition, they, these sets uh, are small. Okay, so the size of x is uh, k and the size of y is k. And they want to somehow communicate, exchange messages, and figure out what they want to know is, what, is the intersection of x and y, you know, are they disjoint or not? That's what they want to know. Is there an element in the intersection? Now, one thing you can, you can see is that, uh, uh, I think uh, Shrikant discussed this yesterday. So you can look at this, fu this function as a matrix. Okay. And uh, then it turns out you can prove, it's, it's not uh, trivial, but you can prove that uh, the, the, this matrix is full rank. Okay. And, and that implies that the, the deterministic complexity Communication complexity of this problem is 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 full, okay. which means for, if if you want to solve this problem deterministically, you must compute, uh, you must send, basically, uh, Alice or Bob must just reveal their their input. There's nothing non-trivial that they can do, which means you must send like to describe either x or y takes uh, log of n choose k bits. So this is the deterministic com complexity of this this problem, and, and this is roughly. Uh, a log n over k. <clears throat> so this is not the protocol that Hassan and Rigdison designed. Uh, what they showed is the, the very nice fact that, that uh, if you're allowed to use randomness, then you can solve this problem with k bits of communication. So you save the log factor. And, uh, very nice idea. So you have two sets, x and, and y. They're potentially small, but they come from a huge universe. And we're going to communicate a number of bits that's independent of the size of the universe. Just k bits of communication. So we have a k bit a randomized protocol. Uh, and I just want to describe that the idea of the protocol is, is really beautiful and simple. So I'll just describe uh, how it works. And let's just think about one message in this protocol. So let me tell you what just one message is. So here's the idea. Uh, Alice and Bob are sitting here. And what they, what they will do is they will use randomness, shared randomness, to sample uh, uniformly random sets z1, z2, from the universe. Just it, imagine an infinite sequence of such sets. <coughs> so these are uh, uniformly random sets of uh, the same universe. Okay. And what Alice will do is she will tell Bob Uh, so Alice will compute the smallest index 
uh, such that her set X is contained in uh, ZI. Okay, and uh, Alice will just send this index to Bob. And uh, the, the thing I want to convince you is that this, this index is both cheap to communicate, but also carries a lot of useful information. And their final protocol will just be repeating this step. They'll alternate this step. Okay, so in the next step, uh, Bob will find uh, the smallest index such that y is contained in zj, using fresh randomness. And then Bob will send that index to uh, Alice, and they'll keep repeating this, this process. So that's the protocol. So the random subsets aren't of size k, they're just random subsets. Yeah, they're just, they're huge random subsets. In the second step, Bob can take y intersection z i, right? Instead of just y. Uh, yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. That was going to be my hard question. <laughs> <laughs> but you already solved it. Uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, so what, what is the point of this protocol? Why, why is it making a lot of progress? Um, think about, let's think about what happens when X and Y are disjoint. Okay. So the, the claim I want to make is that when X and Y are disjoint, this protocol with very small communication will, will quickly <coughs> figure that out, figure out that X and Y are disjoint. And why is that? So you think about X and Y, they're, they're small sets, and say they're disjoint. Uh, what happens when Alice reveals this set, uh, zi? That's a uniformly random set that contains x. That's the distribution of zi. So zi looks like a completely random set, it contains x, so typically it will intersect exact, roughly half of y. This is zi. And uh, Bob can safely discard this part of y. This part is just completely, there's no chance that this intersects uh, x. So this is what Bob does. Bob just completely uh, discard, discards this part. Um, <clears throat> so in the next round, or actually even here, Bob can do this and, and, and repeat. That's what Avishai was suggesting. But the way I was thinking of it is that they both do this sort of in parallel and then, and then do the discarding and repeat it. It doesn't matter, you get the same result. So the point is that this is what happens for zi and for, for zj something similar happens, right? Zj and this part Alice can discard. So when x and y are disjoint, in each step they're discarding half of their, their sets, roughly. Okay, so in the, in the next step, they're, they're trying to solve exactly the same problem, but the sets have shrunk by a factor of two. <clears throat> okay. uh, and moreover, what is the cost of this step? Well, if you think about, so for any particular z here, the probability that x is in z is two to the minus k. Because there are k elements in x, and they must all be contained in z. This happens exactly with probability 2 to the minus k. So typically, you would expect that the value of this index, the first index i that will contain x, would be like 2 to the k. So communicating this index should take k bits of communication. So this, you expect, would take uh, k bits to communicate. <coughs> and and that's, that's pretty much the whole proof. So, here, you spend like uh, k plus k bits, roughly, to communicate. In the next step, you'll, you'll communicate typically k over 2 plus k over 2. And after that, k over 4 plus k over 4. This is a geometrically decreasing sequence. So with order k bits of communication, you will, if the sets are disjoint, they will end up with empty sets. Okay. And they will be done. Yeah. And the randomness of each step is just flipped in the sky for both of them? To yes. Yeah, the randomness is slipped in the sky. Yeah. So it turns out, um, you know, so it turns out that any protocol where the randomness is flipped in the sky can be converted into one cheaply where the randomness is flipped in the hand. Okay. But uh, I won't uh, discuss. That will bring in yeah. dependence on n. That will bring that there will be a cost that's like log of the number of bits in the input. 
But it'll be additive. So it'll be still better than this. Um, okay, so that's uh, the protocol. I'm not, uh, this is the level of detail at which I was going to explain this. So if anyone has any more questions. Yeah. Is this uh, protocol so round optimal as well? If you, have, if you want to do this with a few rounds of communication, can you do this? Oh, that's a good question. I, I guess this takes log k rounds. Uh, I don't, I don't know if I don't know if it's run out tomorrow. Or I don't there, know if anyone. Wasn't there a relative to Tardosh and somebody which showed that this was Merck? Well, yeah. Oh, okay. Cyclum and Tardosh have, uh, have uh, tight round bounds on this. Oh, okay. And this is uh, on that point. Okay. On that, yeah. yeah. Well, I have to. Okay. Great. Uh, <coughs> more questions or comments? Yes, is k-log k-bits or just k-bits? No, just k-bits because there will be k-rounds, uh, log k-rounds, but each subsequent round takes half as many bits as the previous round. Because we're, we're decreasing the size. Because the, the size of sets go back. Our... Yeah. But to get so that's... k-log k, you can use hashing. It's simpler. What? If you're willing to, to, only, to take k-log k, you can use hashing. That's yes, right. If you're oh, if you're willing to do k log k, yeah. And that's yeah, the, but that's the point. So the, the number of rounds is super constant, but the, actually the blow up after the first round is not uh, super constant. It's uh, it's a constant number of bits more, uh, constant factor more. More questions or comments? Yeah. Okay. Um, all right, so that's, that's one clever protocol. Um, now I want to show you another clever protocol, mostly because <laughs> it's a very clever protocol that I think many people haven't seen. Uh, this is a protocol we discussed at lunch. <laughs> yeah, yeah, some, some of you knows it. Uh, but uh, so uh, this is a protocol uh, in the number of the forehead model. And it, it's maybe one of the first communication protocols defined, because it was uh, in one of the first papers, um, <coughs> uh, so here's the problem. Actually, I'll, I'll just do it for three players in the number on the forehead model. <coughs> so say you have Alice, uh, Bob, and Charlie. And uh, the setup is uh, they each have a number on their forehead. And actually, this time, instead of being a bit string, it's, it's really a number. So it's a, a number from 1 through n. And what they want to know is, <coughs> do these numbers add up to n? This is a question that they want to ask. <coughs> uh, so a trivial protocol for this problem would be, uh, you just, you know, each person just does, is missing one number. So you know, Charlie could tell Alice, here's what's on your forehead. That would take log n bits of communication. You just describe this number. So that's, uh, or log n is trivial. And what I'm going to show you is a protocol uh, to Chanda first and Lipton uh, that, that shows that you can do it uh, in order square root log n. This is going to be just determinants. OK, and uh, the, the connection here is actually really beautiful because the way the protocol uh, will, will come is I will, reduce, I will show you that you can use results from uh, combinatorics um, to prove this result. And then you can actually show that the communication complexity of this problem is tightly connected, both upper and lower bounds, to problems in combinatorics. In response to Aaron's question, I mean, randomizes is constant communication, right? Yes, that's a good point. Yeah, right. So if you had a randomized protocol, you could do this with uh, constant bits of communication, because uh, that would be the same as you know, Alice sees two numbers, so he just wants to know he has a you know there's a the value for there's an x value that makes the sum equal to n. It's unique, and Alice just wants to know whether 
the x that's on her forehead is equal to this x value. So it just wants to check equality. And you can use hashing uh, to check that quickly, the constant number of bits of communication. Okay, so in the, for a randomized protocol, it's uh, only a constant number of bits of communication. So you're saying like Alice could communicate with just one person, Bob, to check equality? Yes. Okay. Check whether uh, x equals n minus y minus c. <coughs> Okay, so what, what is the protocol? So the protocol, so, so first let me uh, tell you a, a very nice result. Uh, I think many of you have probably heard of it. So it's uh, due to Behrend. I hope I spell his name correctly. Right. Also, I realize I don't have to spell his name. <laughs> Why am I trying to spell it? Okay. Uh, so what, what is the, the result? Uh, proved there is a coloring of uh, yeah, right, M numbers. So you can always color, color the, the set of numbers 1 through M uh, with uh, 2 to the square root log M colors. such that there will be no monochromatic three-term arithmetic progression in this color. No monochromatic arithmetic progression, which means no monochromatic uh, points of the type uh, A, A plus B, A plus 2D. So for every such triple of uh, distinct uh, numbers, one of them will get a different color from the others. So that's, uh, that's the result that I want to use. <coughs> and uh, you, you, know, you see a square root log m here, so that's going to be the, the complexity of this protocol. So that now the protocol is, is uh, given this coloring, is really simple. Let me tell you what it is. Uh, <coughs> So let's let's look at let's look at two numbers. So here's a setup. There's x, y, z on Alice, Bob, and Charlie's forehead. <coughs> Consider the number x prime, which is n minus y minus z. Okay. And uh, this is a number that Alice can see. <coughs> so Alice knows this. And then there's a the number y prime, which is uh, n minus x minus z. And uh, this is something that Bob knows. <coughs> and here's an observation. Um, the difference between x and x prime that's equal to x plus y plus z minus uh, n, which is also equal to the difference between y and y prime. So, uh, so hiding in here is a protocol that uses that coloring. So let me let me tell you what the protocol is. Uh, so here's the protocol. They just Alice computes uh, x prime plus two y. Bob computes y prime plus oh sorry x x plus two y prime. Sorry, I'm gonna write it like this. X plus two y, x prime plus two y and x plus 2y prime. Here are three numbers. And Charlie knows this one. Uh, Alice knows this one. And Bob knows this one. So each number is known by one of the players. Okay. And what they're going to do is just check that they have the same color in this coloring. Okay, so let's check, check uh, if they have the same color. <clears throat> so that's the whole protocol. And the point is that if uh, x plus y plus z is equal to n, then 
uh, x prime will be equal to x, okay? This difference will be zero, and y prime will be equal to y, so all three will be the same number. So they will certainly have the same color. That part is easy. The slightly tricky part is to show that if this difference is non-zero, then they cannot all have the same color. And that's, that's because these are actually in arithmetic progression. Right? The difference between these two, that's this number. And the difference between these two is two times this number. Uh, sorry, the difference between this and the first one is two times this number. So they're really three numbers in arithmetic progression. This is uh, A, A plus D, and uh, A plus 2D, where uh, D is this X minus X prime, or X prime minus X. Yeah? Um, how do they agree on a color? Coloring? They know the coloring ahead of time. So you know, we know there's one coloring. Before they see their inputs, everybody agrees on this coloring. Okay. And we don't count that communication? No. Or can one person just check it and tell the other one or zero? Uh, that's part of the code of the protocol, right? So you imagine that the protocol is described, the description has this. Is it explicit, explicit um, You can write it down. Yeah, actually, it's even, yeah, that's true. The other thing is that the, the coloring is also very explicit. I can tell you, but I won't. But uh, if I wanted to, I could tell you exactly what they sent. <laughs> The way you're trying to refer some let them do it is by random shifts of the sets. Yeah, but it turns out you can actually not do that. I guess I was more asking, like, uh, in a uniform way, it's canonical for each M as you scale up. Basically. Yeah, that, that true is too. Yeah. So it turns out the coloring looks something like uh, you view these numbers, you write them in a particular base, basis. As a, you, view them, you look at the digits in a theory representation, and then you send some statistics about the vectors that you get, like the length of these vectors, and some other statistics. But I think more importantly, I think in general protocols are allowed to be non-uniform. Yes. Uh, so they can depend arbitrarily on n and other such things. <coughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. The other way you can think about it is that they can each compute the lexicographically first coloring on their own. True. Yeah, that too. Yeah. Good point. Okay, so um, okay, so here are two. These are two interesting. Pro Any more questions? Is this tight? Ah, is this tight? Yes, actually, I wanted to talk about that. Right, so I forgot about that part. Yeah, so what, what uh, Chandler first and Lipton showed actually is that. So here is some problem from combinatorics, but what they what they showed is that there is another problem from combinatorics called the, the corners problem. Okay, this is the question if you have a n by n. Uh, grid, and you want to color the points to avoid a monochromatic corner. Okay, a corner is something like this, where this distance is d and this distance is d. Okay, this is an old problem in The question is, how many colors do you need to color the n by n grid so that there are no monochromatic, uh, there are no monochromatic corners? And it turns out the, the answer there is directly related. It's actually the same as the communication complexity of this problem up to either some logs involved. But the answer to this question is the same as the answer to this question. So that's why maybe it's not so. So the, the way you can find this coloring is actually there are old results relating this question to this question. And this one is also not known exactly. And this one is not known. So the best lower bound, right, so the, to your question, um, in terms of communication, the best lower bound you can get from results on that problem is like omega log log n. So there's an exponential gap between these two. But if you could close this gap, you would be uh, really solving very old problems. Bef problems older than complexity theory. What do we know for more than three parties? Uh, everything I said can be generalized to more than three parties in both the upper bounds and this connection. The parameters get more hairy. So for more than three parties, it's like trying to find a coloring that avoids four-term arithmetic progressions, I think, is, is enough. It's more like, and here it becomes like a multi-dimensional, like you have a, a three-dimensional grid, and then you're looking for this structure. I believe that's, that's true, although I haven't carefully checked.
more questions or comments? <clears throat> okay, so I expected not to meet my expectations in terms of time, but I think it's good. Uh, so what I'm going to do, uh, this, these are the two. that expectation. Yeah, try not to meet that. Uh, okay, so the, the, these are two protocols which I think are clever. And now what I want to show you is uh, some, uh, the sort of the right, the, some connections to the right side of the board that from what I was in, in that picture that I drew earlier. There's a lower bound for this, Matthew lower bound. For, for this one? Yeah. Yes. So, right. Okay, so for, yeah, for, for disjointness, we do know that, um, yeah, that, that this is basically tight. You need, you need k bits uh, if you have sets of size k, even with randomized protocols. Because even if you have a universe of size k, it's... Yeah. Even if the universe of size k and you have sets of size k, you need k bits. Okay, so... Uh, the, the, first, the first connection I want to show from communication to something that doesn't look like has anything to do with com communication is uh, I want to prove uh, lower bounds on Boolean formulas. So <coughs> this is an old result of uh, Nechi Porok. And he didn't <coughs> explain it. There, there was no communication complexity when he proved this result. So he doesn't explain it in terms of communication, but actually it's, it's uh, really... Uh, is the result about communication. So I want to show you how that you can view it like that. Uh, so what did Nechi uh prove? So he was interested in, in, in uh, the model where you have a formula and uh, the gates can compute arbitrary functions of their inputs. So the circuit we're, circuits we're looking at are trees. Looks like this. <coughs> and every gate here computes some arbitrary function of its... Uh, Try it a little bit longer because I'll use it <laughs> soon. Okay, so that's the formula. Every gate computes some arbitrary function of its inputs, and and uh, w what he showed is he gave an example of a Boolean function that requires high complexity in this model. The complexity here is just a number of wires or or nodes. It's the same. Um, <clears throat> okay, so the function we're going to be interested in is uh, the element distinctness function or distinctness function. So what is that function? Uh, the function uh, maps numbers. It's given uh, n numbers from the set 1 through 2n. Okay. It's a Boolean function. And uh, the way it's defined, you look at the n numbers x1 through xn, and you output uh, 1 if they're distinct you actually have n distinct numbers there, and uh, 0 otherwise. That's the function. And uh, the, the theorem is that <coughs> uh, this requires uh, omega n squared uh, size. Now, I did something a little bit tricky here, so maybe it's confusing. So the input length is n log n. Okay, that's where the log is going. It's usually in, the, in this lower bound. The input length is n log n, and now the lower bound will be like n squared. <coughs> so that's the result I want to prove, and I, I want to show you how you can uh, do it with communication. Yeah? Just to be clear, the, the, this is spanning two specifically, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. <coughs> Any other questions about the model? So when it's usually stated, the lower bound is n squared over log n or log squared? I think log n. Well, I'm going to prove log n. Sorry, better. But aren't you getting log squared? You're, you're proving n squared over log squared. If you use n squared as your why am I proving log squared? It's uh, if you use n squared as your domain, you oh, get a better. Square. Oh, I see. I see. Okay. Yeah. yeah. There might be yes. If you use n squared instead of two n, you'll get a better bound oh. in terms of its inputs. Okay. Uh, Yeah, so I guess I'm, I'm not doing the right setting of parameters, but I will stick with it. <coughs> okay, so <coughs> uh, 
it's interesting because there, there isn't obviously a communication. I mean, the, the first thing when you think about uh, the relationship between communication and, and circuits is that the gates are communicating with each other. Okay. Uh, but that's not, you know, uh, that's not going to be the reduction. The reduction is going to be pretty clever. Uh, <clears throat> so here's the problem we'll reduce to. Um, so consider the following problem. Alice is given a set uh, x that's a subset of 2n uh, of size exactly n, or actually size n minus 1. And Bob has an element i from 1 through 2n. And they want to know, <coughs> uh, is i an x? OK, so is i an x? Okay, but the, the protocol is restricted. The, the way the protocol works, it's a really simple protocol. Alice is just going to send a message. And then Bob needs to be able to answer this question, is I next? So Alice has a set that has roughly half of the elements in the universe. Uh, Bob has an element. Alice needs to send a message. And then Bob needs to figure out, is, is uh, his, el his, his element in the set x? And it's pretty easy to see that uh, you need omega. That basically, you have to, Alice must describe the set, right? If there's any uncertainty about what the set is, then Bob cannot figure, figure out. You know, if Bob can answer this question for every i, that means Bob must know the set. So it's a kind of a trivial lower bound that you need, uh, you, you need actually log of n choose, uh, 2 n choose n minus 1, which is uh, like uh, 2 n minus some lower term. Root. Root. Root squared log n. Oh, no, 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 it's, no, it's right, right. 2 to the 2n divided by yeah, squared right, n, right, and when right, you right. take logs, that's yeah, the, right. the half is here. OK, so this is required. And now I want to show you that if you have any, uh, if you have any such formula, actually, you, if you have a formula that has size significantly less than n squared, you violate this, this bound. Okay, so I want to go from a size bound in this formula to, uh, to a communication protocol. And so let's do it. So how does it work? Uh, so suppose you have a formula uh, uh, that has, so suppose you have uh, such a formula, and it has uh, less than epsilon times n squared leads. In a, in a formula, the number of leaves is essentially the same as the overall size. They're within constant factors of each other. Okay? This is from the, just the combinatorics of trees. So uh, if the size is small and so are the number of leaves, well, that's the trivial direction. The number of leaves is uh, at most epsilon times n squared. And, and this means that here you have n variables, right? One of them must be read uh, less than epsilon n times, just by averaging. <coughs> so, it implies, so it implies that there are epsilon n uh, leaves uh, reading a bit from uh, some input uh, xj. So there, there's some input, some j, such that at most epsilon n leaves read from xj. So let's, let's look at all of these leaves okay, and say uh, they're here. So I'm going to draw squares around them. So this is one of them. This is one of them. This is way more than epsilon n, but uh, it helps to, to understand what I'm doing next. So, so these are now the set of leaves that read from xj. So just to understand what's going to happen in, with Alice and Bob, Alice is going to get all the elements that are uh, not the jth one, and Bob is going to get just the jth element. Okay. And uh, <coughs> that's what's going to happen in the reduction. So now, uh, so, so now, now I'm going to do something just in pictures, which I hope should be convinc convincing. So consider this tree. Okay. 
so yeah, the rest of it is here. Okay. <clears throat> so that's a tree that's defined by these leaves. Uh, basically, you take all the paths from a leaf to the root, and uh, I sort of only consider those nodes where two of these paths converge. This gives me a tree. And, and this tree has a small number of edges, right? It's basically sort of looks like a formula. Every vertex has two children. Uh, and the number of leaves is only epsilon n. So the number of edges in this tree is small. This is, this is going to be important for how we'll design the protocol. So now, now let me tell you how the protocol works. So looking at this picture, you know, Alice has the subset x. And she will just set x1 through you know, up to x uh, j minus 1, xj plus 1, xn. These are the elements that she will uh, set from x. Okay. So we'll just set these elements. <coughs> Bob has y, uh, Bob has i, which you'll just set to be uh, xj. Okay. And now they want to do something with this formula. They want to communicate. I mean, Alice needs to send Bob a message, but Alice is going to send only order epsilon n bits in the message. And Bob will be able to compute whether or not xj is one of these elements. The point is that, you know, if xj is one of these elements, then these n elements are not distinct. Okay. And uh, if xj is not one of these elements, then these elements are distinct. So if you can compute the output of this formula on these inputs, we're done. But now Alice just needs to send a small, a short message so that Bob can compute the output. Okay. And Bob, Bob's not allowed to speak. <clears throat> so I wonder if someone who hasn't seen this before has an idea of how you might do it. So, so the, the, the hint is that you sort of want to compute only a constant number of bits per edge in this picture. So Alice knows all of the non-square nodes here. She doesn't know the inputs at the square. But she wants to send Bob enough information to compute the output here. And she's going to send only a constant number of bits per edge. Or per gate. Or per gate. Same thing, yeah. Yeah. Maybe everyone has seen. Yeah. I mean, she she knows what the sort of the function in terms of x j is for each gate. So and yep. that's you know uh, two bits max. So she can just send that for each gate. Exactly. Yeah. Very good. So the point is, although there, for example, in this path, you know, if Bob knows this value, um, Alice knows all the values that sort of interact with this path. So the value that's feeding here is some, from Alice's perspective, is some function of this single bit. There's only one bit that Alice doesn't know. So Alice just needs to describe this bit to Bob, uh, this, this function to Bob. So once Bob knows how to take this bit and convert it into the input into here, and this bit convert it into the input here, and can do that for the whole tree, then, then Bob can compute the whole uh, formula. So Alice just describes for each of these edges what is the function that Bob should apply to the bit that's coming from below. And that's a constant number of bits uh, per edge here. So that gives you uh, overall epsilon bits of communication. It violates that. Any questions about that reduction? Okay, so I'll stop here, and then uh, when we return, we'll talk about more reductions to uh, proving lower bonds and circuits and other models.